Okay, so I'd like to welcome you to this evening's lecture session, which is first in the Royal Society Te Aparangi uh, lecture series, Great Kiwi Research, Sharing Women's Discovery. I'm Alison Downard, um, I'm a member of the School of Physical and Chemical Sciences at the University of Canterbury, and I'm a fellow of the Royal Society Te Aparangi. Uh, te Aparangi. So this lecture series, um, as the name implies, is um, celebrating women's research in New Zealand. The lecture series covers um, a broad discipline of topics and is, is aimed to give an insight into the kind of problems and the kind of discoveries that are being made by women scientists in New Zealand. The series is one of a number of activities that are celebrating 150 years of the Royal Society in New Zealand. This evening's session, which is presented in partnership with the University of Canterbury, is entitled Protecting Taonga, Snapshots from a Conservation Biologist and Environmental Chemist. So we're hearing from two University of Canterbury scientists uh, about their work protecting Aotearoa's uh, natural treasures. So the plan for the evening is that first I'll introduce our first speaker, um, Dr Tammy Steves, and then Tammy will give her presentation. Then I'll introduce our second speaker, Associate Professor Sally Gore, and she'll give her presentation, and then at the end we will have time for questions. So in the question time we'll have the opportunity to ask questions of both of the speakers. So, um, to kick off then, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr Tammy Steves, a conservation uh, geneticist. So Tammy came to uh, New Zealand in 2004 from Canada. She was um, on a two-year NSERC postdoctoral fellow. Um, she says that mere months away from returning to Canada for another postdoctoral fellowship, she met her um, then, her now husband, um, a staunch Cantabrian. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> and so she decided to stay for love, and she says in brackets, science. And a few years later, she secured a permanent position in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Canterbury. And Tammy's now a senior lecturer in that school. So Tammy works with a number of lesser known Taonga species and says she is happiest when being of some use. So in this talk, Tammy will give a snapshot of how she and other members of her conservation, systematics and evolution research team use genetic and genomic data to inform conservation management in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Tammy. I think I want your mic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 uh, before I begin, I'd like to mihi to the mana whanua of this place, uh, unai tahu atere, sorry, nai tua atereri, um, and also to te um, aparangi, so Royal Society of New Zealand, for inviting me to actually speak in this really exciting seminar series. And of course, to, to my place here um, at University of Canterbury, or te whare wananga o waitaha. Um, so to actually make that connect between the Royal Society and the public lecture series. So Nareira Tanakoto Katoa. So I'd like to begin with a with a fakatoki, often sung as a waiata as well. There is no greater thing than that which is handed down with love from the ancestors. And I'm hopeful after the end of this wee snapshot of the work that my research group and I do you'll understand why this resonates with us, because fundamentally what we seek to do is to use genetic and genomic data to inform the conservation management of threatened Tauna species in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And essentially what we're trying to do is to retain the whakapapa of these species. But before we delve into how we might actually do that, I'd like you just to close your eyes 
and think about what is genetic and genomic data. So just close your eyes for a moment and open them again. Now I suspect somebody, at least one of you in the room, might have conjured up this. DNA, the instructions of life, fundamentally what we want to do is use the information that's captured in the DNA of these species to inform their conservation management. We'll talk about why we might do that, but first let's just explore what I mean when I say genetic data versus genomic data. If we think of DNA, so for humans we're looking at a three billion base pairs is what we call them of DNA. We'll think about birds, it's a bit smaller, it's about a billion. So we'll think about that DNA as a puzzle and say how much of that puzzle do we actually use to inform conservation management. Until re really recently, we used very little of that puzzle and we called them genetic markers. They were hopefully evenly scattered throughout the genome, but there was more than just a mere handful. Now today, because of emerging technologies, we're getting much better at actually harnessing much more of that billion base pairs for birds, for example. And when we do that, what we're doing is using more of the DNA puzzle. And that is our genomic approach. And what we hope by doing that is that we're looking at a more representative sample of all of that DNA that we might find in individual or in species of birds, for example. So that's genetics and genomics, but why? Why would we do that? And, to, and why we might do that, we might think about, let's use an example of how we could do that. And we're going to do that using a species that's quite close to my heart. So it's the critically endangered kaki or black stilt. Now kaki, for those of you who are not familiar with this species, it was once widespread between the North and the South Island, but by the end of the 1980s, it was confined to the upper Waitaki Basin. So down around Twizel. When the kaki recovery program was started in 1983, 1981, there were 23 adults. We've made some progress. Today, there's 107 but we've got lots of work to do. Now, like a lot of threatened town species in New Zealand, the reason why we saw such a drastic decline in numbers and in distribution of this particular species is because of invasive mammalian predators and because of habitat loss and alteration. So we might think about, well, if we wanna enhance the recovery of these species, shouldn't we tackle those issues? Why conservation genetics? Why should we worry about that DNA puzzle? And the reason why is because we know when we have these nice big populations that are shrunk down in size and they stay down in that little tiny size for a long time, they lose something that we call genetic diversity. Effectively, those populations have gone through a bottleneck and what happens is the amount of variation that they had in their DNA is lost. And more of it is lost the longer they stay smaller. Now the reason why we care about that is that it may be all well and good if we had 50 kaki cruising around the upper Waitaki Basin, quite happily all genetically identical, but if the environment changed, then those birds would be unable or that population or species would be unable to actually adapt that changing environment because they had no underlying genetic diversity. So fundamentally what we're trying to do as conservation geneticists or Sometimes these days people call us conservation genomicists. What we're trying to do is to minimize the loss of that genetic diversity so that that species actually can be resilient in the face of a changing climate. Now for some species where there might be a closely related species nearby that isn't actually threatened, it can cause an extra layer or an extra challenge as to why we might want to use genetic data. And there's one just hiding in this slide right here. So here's our kaki, and this is actually puaka. I'm gonna talk a little bit about puaka, or pied stilt, and really tell you a bit of a, a story of when I first got here about 13 years ago. And the question was, are kaki just puaka in disguise? And the reason why we were asking this question is because we had kaki, a beautiful all black, our fake all black, our favorite feathered all black, yes, okay, staunch Cantabrian, only bird to actually overwinter in the upper Waitaki, which is a main feat, and Puaka. 
self-introduced from Australia in the late um, late 19 or sorry, 1890s, maybe a little bit into the 1900s. But we consider this uh, this introduction event to be human induced for various reasons, and we started to wonder about whether or not the kaki that we were seeing were in fact genetically kaki, or if they were actually just puaka dressed up in, a, in kaki feathers. And part of that reason is because we had birds appearing that seemed to be in mixed plumage or have a mixture of feathers that might be in, in between or intermediate to kaki and puaka. So one question was, well, they look like hybrids. Are they genetically hybrids? But more importantly, are our black birds actually genetically kaki or are they what we call a cryptic hybrid? So what I just want to show you now quite briefly is how we use genetic data. So this is just that handful of markers scattered throughout the genome to address this question. And essentially what we're looking at here is a number of bar um, columns and this each little bar represents an individual. And the orange color represents birds that are, that are genetically kaki, and the blue represents birds that are genetically puaka. And what I hope you can see is, except for one pesky individual right here, who subsequently died of natural causes and did not leave any offspring, <laughs> they are all genetically pure kaki, based on these data. As well, we see a mixture of blue and orange in our hybrids, so they are in fact hybrids, and our puaka are generally puaka. So we might say, okay, well, we're done here. Why would we move on to look at a genomic approach? And there's a large number of reasons why we might do that, because it's a snapshot. I'm gonna tell you one, okay? So generally, when I talked about this idea of using a genetic approach, we've got that handful of markers throughout the genome. What if we miss something? What if actually kaki aren't quite as genetically pure as we think? And more interestingly, then what do we do from a conservation management perspective? So the, I have a fantastic PhD student that I have the privilege of working with, Natalie Forstick, who is down at Otago. Her senior supervisor is Michelle Knapp, and she is currently, literally, as we speak, putting together the Kaki genome, also a Puaka genome, and will ultimately be generating lots and lots and lots of those puzzle pieces to readdress that question to see what, if anything, we might have missed. Now, as it stands, the way things work in conservation management, particularly with genetic data, particularly in New Zealand, where we're used to being quite adaptive and quite willing to take on a challenge, I remember point blank that day when I said to a, a dear friend of mine who's also a conservation practitioner, what if we got it wrong? And he said, well, we'll just change our management. And so we're at a stage now where we literally need to watch this space with this research because we don't know if we're going to be tackling an even more exciting yet convoluted question about kaki if we do find evidence of a little bit of puaka DNA in kaki. And we might ask questions like, is that actual kaki DNA there because it confers some sort of advantage to kaki? If we think about it, kaki are completely naive to mammalian predators Puaka evolved in Australia. They're not naive. There's lots of really exciting questions that we can answer. So if you do ever get to see a chance to see Nat speak, check it out for sure. Another snapshot that I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time on relates to some work that another Sterling PhD student of mine does. And it relates to the captain breeding for release program that we use for kaki. So like a lot of threatened birds in New Zealand, or even not just birds, a lot of threatened species, we do have captive breeding for release programs where at some stage birds are brought into captivity or retained in captivity. Captive pairing decisions are made, clutches are laid, chicks are hatched, they're brooded, they're usually grown up to they're a little bit older, sub or juvenile or sub-adult, and then released to the wild. And related to this in Kaki, we've got another layer where we actually have a captive rearing program because there are captive birds that actually breed out in the wild. So those captive pairs lay eggs, those eggs are brought into captivity, they're, they're, um, they're incubated, the chicks are brooded, and they're subsequently released. So which means we have a really complex but an interesting situation where we have wild birds and captive birds in a breeding rearing program for this particular species. 
Now, as far as those captive pairing decisions go, we are essentially match matchmakers for Kaki. This is what we do. And we do this because we know this relationship. This is some research done by a previous postdoc uh, in my group named Aaron Hagen. And what we showed here is that the more related two birds are to one another, the fewer chicks they'll actually hatch. And ergo, the less related any two birds are, the more chicks they'll hatch. Now this has got cons important consequences in both the short and the long term. In the short term, it means more chicks, which means we've got more birds to actually release to the wild. And those circles there actually represent the actual number of birds that were, that were hatched out by any one pair. So we can again see those bigger circles in, in for those pairs that are not that related to one another. But the other important layer is that long-term picture because when we pair together two individuals that are not that related to one another, their offspring are more genetically diverse. When we pair two individuals together that are quite related together, related to one another, their offspring are less diverse. So by doing it this way, by actually going right, we need to pair birds that are the least related together as possible. In the short term, we'll get more chicks, which means we have more birds for release. And in the long term, we'll have more resilient kaki. So we might think, well, we're done here. This is gonna be a short talk, right? But we're not done. Because again, that data that I showed you was based on that handful of genetic markers. And like everyone in New Zealand, we wanna do better. We want to do the absolute best, particularly for our Tauna species. And so what um, my PhD student Stephanie Gala is doing is essentially a proof of concept that is testing a hypothesis that the most efficient and effective way to make captive pairing decisions for Kaki and many other species, both here in New Zealand and around the world, is to actually use a genomic approach, to use those many, many puzzle pieces to actually estimate relatedness. And there's lots of reasons why we might think that, but again, mindful of time. So what I want to do now is we are here in Christchurch. Let's pop your hard hat on. And we're going to little, look a little bit at some of Stephanie's preliminary data. And essentially what we want to ask here is, do we get the same sort of estimates of relatedness, which is just how related any two birds might be to one another, based on pedigree data, genetic data, or also genomic data? And what we're seeing here isn't terribly surprising, and it's consistent with our hypothesis that the way forward is actually with genomics. And so because what we can see is there's certainly a positive relationship between those estimates based on the pedigree and those handful of markers or those few little puzzle pieces, but the spread is much, much tighter when we actually use that genomic data. And similarly, we do see a relationship between the genetics and the genomics, which just makes you feel a little bit better about what you're doing, right? Because it'd be a bit of a worry if it didn't. But fundamentally, what it means is that we use pedigrees a lot for captive breeding, not for release programs. When you think about zoos, where those animals are going nowhere. And those pedigrees tend to be quite robust. They tend to be many generations deep. They tend to have no birds or no animals of unknown pedigree or unknown history. But as soon as we bring wild birds or wild animals into a pedigree, we make it both more challenging and also more interesting. So even though there are very few kaki alive today, because we have a wild population, well, we have birds uh, paired in the wild and in captivity, and because the birds can multiple clutch, which means lay them more than one clutch per season, the Kaki pedigree has got many, many thousands of individuals in it. Or how many, exactly how many? 2,000. 2,000, thank you, see? No numbers for me. 2,000, thank you. Okay, and Stephanie has painstakingly put this pedigree to together in, oh, about 500 hours. And it's interesting because now we have to start thinking about just how robust is that pedigree? Because for a long time, we thought, you know what? Given the natural history of Kaki, they are probably socially monogamous. They've got a female at a nest, a male at a nest. Every egg that is found at that nest belongs to them. We don't have females seeking mating with other males elsewhere. 
But we're actually testing that hypothesis now with a student named Ashley Overbeek just to make sure because you can imagine how that could wreak havoc on your pedigree. And after, oh, I don't know, 30 plus years of Doc Rangers looking at khaki in the field, literally a couple weeks ago, I had Cody Thine, an awesome Doc Ranger, go, Tammy, you'll never believe what I saw in the Tasman. And basically what he described, I'm paraphrasing, so apologies, Cody, if I get this wrong, we've got two nests in the Tasman relatively close together. We haven't had nests close together for a long time. These are critically endangered species. Two nests close together, a male at this nest, a male and female at this nest. The female leaves the nest, the male leaves the nest, they mate while the other male watches. Okay? <laughs> so, we wonder just how robust the khaki pedigree is. We wonder if this is something that's been persistent in the evolutionary history of this bird, or if it's just a product of the fact of how it is and where it is that we're releasing them. So that's another watch this space. But I've got one last kind of fun fact where we have birds that sometimes don't look like they're supposed to look like. And when you spend, oh, one to two thousand dollars per bird to actually raise them in captivity and release them, you kind of want to make want to make sure that you've got the right birds. And these are a couple of examples where we actually had the wrong birds. And we used genetic data to actually figure that out. So, and this is again, Ashley Overbeek did this work as an undergraduate, and, uh, and it's, well, I'm biased, but it's super fun stuff. So, we've got bird three. It's a wee bit of a small image here. Now, bird three, at the age that it was at, should look like a cocky juvenile. It doesn't look exactly right. We call them kind of blonde <coughs> birds. This bird down here should be an adult. Bird four doesn't look like this bird. When this first cropped up, the first question you ask is, well, what did the siblings look like? You brought in a clutch. These both come from wild pairs. You brought in a clutch. What did the sibs look like? Well, the gray in these colors means that they never, those birds never actually made it to reproductive age. So we don't actually know what they looked like. So what we had was a dock ranger going, oh, fuck, I brought in the wrong nest. I said, oh, but don't wait, we can check. And this is how we checked. So basically what we've got is we've got eight of these little genetic markers. There's two variants for each marker. We know what mom and dad look like. We look at the siblings at the nest and say, okay, do you belong to mom and dad? And they belong to mom and dad. So it's like, whoo, didn't bring in the wrong nest, that's good. But what about our funny looking bird three? Well, it turns out many of the variant forms of the genetic markers it had could not be attributed to mom or dad at the nest. And moreover, they were actually attributed to, allele, to variants that are only found in Powaka. And we saw the exact same thing for bird number four. The siblings at the nest definitely belonged to mom and dad at the nest, but bird number four, who doesn't look like the others, did not. And this is probably one of my favorite terms uh, ever, because it sounds super scientific. This is called an egg dump. <laughs> And essentially what happened is that a, that a pregnant Puaka or Puaka hybrid came by and went, hmm, you'll do. And there's lots of really cool evolutionary reasons why that might happen. We don't know how, how frequently this happens, not only in Kaki, but in other closely related birds. But I can say that we are picking up these affectionately called weirdos from time to time. So, I think that's my snapshot over, except to say, obviously, I'm pretty excited about Kaki, but a lot of the work that we do can be applied and is being applied to other threatened tauna within New Zealand and also with collaborators overseas. And, uh, and also uh, done in partnership with conservation practitioners in relevant Māori communities as well, which is something we're pretty proud of. Um, I can't say goodbye without first acknowledging these two superstars. So this is Stephanie Gala and Natalie Forstick. The three of us are Team Kaki. Um, and I actually fell ice skating on Friday with my six-year-old daughter. I'm recovering from a concussion, and the only reason I have slides is because of these two beautiful women. Okay, so thank you to them. And, uh, and their awesome research, watch out for. Uh, it takes a village to do this kind of research. This is, this is the village that we work with, and if you've not yet voted for Bird of the Year, <laughs> vote for Kaki.
Thanks very much, to yeah, no Tammy. And um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions at the end. I feel a bit guilty. I have voted for Bird of the Year, but it was not. <laughs> have you got Thank another you. email address? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a way. There's a way. <laughs> Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce um, Associate Professor Sally Gore, who's an environmental chemist. So Sally's actually been a colleague of mine in the School of Physical and Chemical Sciences for the past 10 years, well most of that time as the Department of Chemistry, of course. Um, prior to that, she worked at uh, ESR Limited here in Christchurch, where she was an environmental health scientist. Um, research in Sally's environmental chemistry um, research group focuses on the fate and behaviour of contaminants in the environment and in, in including human exposure to contaminants. This evening, Sally will present an overview of the types of research questions she and her students are currently tackling. They have a particular interest in coastal environments and um, including the effects um, of everyday life and how that contributes to marine pollution. Okay. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight and also thank Alison for her introduction and the Royal Society for inviting me to speak. Um, it's a great honour to be asked to take part in a series like this. So as Alison said, I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing to answer some questions. And I'm really going to talk you through some of the questions we are answer, we're trying to answer and some of the ways we're tackling it. And I'd like to start by acknowledging these four people here. One of the great um, privileges of working for the university is my students. And so the work I'm going to present tonight is a combination of um, two PhD projects, parts of two PhD projects, a master's project and an honours project. So we have Phil Emnett in the pink, uh, this is Sam. I must admit I was a little bit unhappy when I saw that picture because I knew they'd been jumping out of the boat, but that one sort of worried me. Um, <laughs> Phil Clooney's Ross uh, digging up at New Brighton and Nicole McRae, um, a recently finished PhD student. So I'm interested in emerging contaminants. These are contaminants that haven't yet made it onto anyone's sort of routine monitoring list. These are the contaminants that we are starting to be concerned about. We know something about them. We're worried about their toxicity. We may also be concerned about them because we can now find them. So recent advances in the last 10 years in our analytical equipment means that we can now worry about some of these things. It's likely they have been in the environment for a very long time. They include things like pharmaceuticals and personal care products, so active ingredients in soaps and shampoos, those are some of my favourites that I work on, and also um, microplastics. These may be candidates for future regulation, and many of them people around the world are looking at them and saying, yes, we're going to need to know more about them. And so we're contributing to that as well. Why do I work in the marine environment? Well, most of what we know about these contaminants has come from Europe and America, where they've worked in freshwater environments. And we're coastal. Most of our population lives within 10 kilometres of the coast. I don't think anyone in New Zealand lives more than about 115 kilometres from the coast. Nearly all of our sewage, which is how most of these contaminants will end up in the environment, is discharged into, into the coastal areas. And of course, we consider our coastline one of our treasures. And it's something that we all cherish and we all value. And these, our coastal areas are under increasing pressure with urbanisation, marinas, the debate around aquaculture, and of course climate change. In 2016, the Ministry for the Environment put together a fantastic report called Aotea, Environment Aotearoa, and this kind of gave us a state of the New Zealand environment. And I've just highlighted some of the things around the New Zealand coastal environment, and they, the, the consensus was that these environments are degraded, that our native birds and mammals are threatened with extinction and that well, the changes that are coming with global warming um, and um, ocean acidification will only add to those challenges. So this is why I unashamedly focus on the marine environment. It may also be because I live at the beach. So we've been working on questions like this over sort of the last nine years. Do everyday household items contribute to marine pollution? So do the things we do in our daily activity using things that are really familiar to us, are they contributing to the marine problem? Are the organisms that in our marine environments, 
Are they being exposed to some of these contaminants? And then do New Zealand species behave in the same way? So can we import guidelines and regulations from overseas, which is going to be an important question if we're going to start regulating these compounds, because we're not going to be able to do the science in New Zealand um, on our own. We're going to need to do this as a global effort. So the first of the studies we undertook, and this will fill in its work, uh, was to look where, whether some of these emerging organic contaminants were actually present in coastal waters. I mean, there's a lot of water out there. Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe we can't find them. So we undertook a 12-month study in Littleton Harbour, looking at what are the wastewater that was going in from the three wastewater treatment plants, the seawater, sediment, and we worked on mussels. Unfortunately, that wasn't quite so successful, but we had a look to see whether some of these things were present. We looked for different groups of chemicals because we were trying to get an idea of what might be there and what we could analyti analytically do at the university at the time. So we looked for preservatives and antimicrobial compounds, so things like triclosan, which is in some toothpaste and in some um, sports clothing, UV filters, which are the sunscreen um, compounds, which now are turning out to be everywhere, some hormones that are released by people, um, also the active ingredient from the contraceptive pill, some industrial chemicals, and then uh, a plastic monomer. So it makes um, BPA, the polycarbonate plastic. We found that what we found in the wastewater was consistent with what you would expect to see overseas. We did find many of the compounds that we were looking for, but at low concentrations. So those concentrations are up to sort of about 400 nanograms per litre. Now one nanogram per litre is one drop in 20 Olympic swimming pools. So I'm still kind of amazed that we can do this, um, but we can, and we can do it reliably, which I'm quite pleased about. And we did find some of those um, antimicrobials, surfactant, a lot of UV filters, and that tended to be quite seasonal. Winter and summer, we saw distinctly different patterns, the steroid hormones, and BPA, which is now turning out to be a ubiquitous contaminant. When we were looking in the marine environment, the picture changed a little bit. So, Firstly, what the concentrations of the contaminants we found were consistent with overseas, but we found compounds in the marine environment that we didn't find in the wastewater. So that means that our assumption that wastewater was the only pathway is, is, is maybe not true. And that makes sense, Littleton Harbour, there's a lot of stormwater that goes in, there's a lot of ships, um, there's shipping yards, so there are other sources that could go in there. But we did find some of those compounds um, in, in both the wastewater and the seawater and in the sediment. We weren't so good at doing the mussels, um, that's because they're quite a tricky matrix, they've got a lot of fats and other things in them, and so one of the things that we'll be doing next year is we've got a new PhD student coming and he's going to go back and revisit analysing shellfish and hopefully we'll get some more reliable data, but we could say yes, there are three of the compounds the method worked for and we could find them in the, um, in the mussels. So now that we knew that, yes, emerging contaminants were present, and drawing on data from some colleagues elsewhere who'd been looking again at wastewater treatment plants, we started to see, well, does it matter? Is there any effect with toxicity? And so this was some work done by Nicole, and she was supervised by um, Chris Glover, who at then was at, um, here in the School of Biological Sciences and has now moved to Canada was we looked at what happens when we expose enunga, the white bait, to um, voltaren. Now the reason we chose voltaren, or diclofenac, is because that is one of the few of these compounds that has made it onto a watch list. And people are concerned enough about its effects on humans and on aquatic organisms, and particularly fish, to say, hang on a minute, we need to collect more data for this. And this will probably be one of the first compounds that gets regulated in the environment. So. We know it's a contaminant of concern. We chose enanga because they are a sort of, we like to think they're a unique New Zealand species. They're actually not. They're common throughout the southern hemisphere. They're looking at using them for aquaculture in South America. But why we chose them is that they have a different lifestyle to a lot of fish. They're, they're truly migratory. Different life stages will live in different, um, so, the adults will go out to sea to spawn and the young will migrate back. So they live, they're live. very tolerant of both fresh and salt water. And an important component is they don't have scales. So they now have a different pathway where things might be able to pass through their skin. 
So this was a good one to think about, will guidelines developed internationally protect some of our um, treasured fish species? So Nicole did a um, ex acute um, exposure assay in the laboratory. She used different concentrations of Voltaren. Uh, one of them, the 0.17, that's kind of what we'd expect to find in the environment. The higher concentration was one where we thought we might see an effect. Now what this graph shows here is actually um, a biomarker of damage, which is indicating that this might go on and cause harm to the fish. So this is um, lipid peroxidation and this was in the fish liver. So you can see there's quite a big jump from the control where there was no diclofenac through to the lowest exposure and then to the highest exposure. So this meant that we were getting a toxicologically relevant response. The fish weren't happy, they were showing signs that they were being affected at environmentally relevant concentrations. Nicole then, uh, we went on with a collaboration with uh, Baylor University in Texas where she repeated some of this work with the types of fish that would be used to develop guidelines in North America. So, um, and she found quite big differences between the species and it depended on which fish species was used. So that left us thinking, well, maybe some of the guidelines in the US, developed in the US, won't protect our fish, but what we've seen is they won't protect all their fish either, because there are species differences in response. About, as we started moving towards the end of um, Nicole's project, we then started thinking about microplastics. And bear with me, there is a theme here, these come together at the end. So microplastics are another emerging contaminant. And I don't think you can nearly pick up a newspaper article, a newspaper now where somebody hasn't talking about microplastics or the concern over plastic. So microplastics are the very small plastic particles. Now they are either deliberately produced to be small or they are produced from the breakdown of larger plastic debris in the environment. They're now considered ubiquitous, which means you can find them everywhere. Anywhere that everyone's looked, sea ice, deep trenches, wherever, they find these small plastic particles. And we know that they can be taken up by organisms. Once they've been taken up by an organism, they can have a couple of effects. One, they can impact growth and reproduction because the organism has got plastic in its gut and it's not getting the energy that it needs because it can't break down the plastic. Or, worst case scenario, its gut fills up with plastic, and this is particularly important for um, shellfish and, others, and other sort of filter feeders, and so they don't feel hungry anymore, their gut's full, so they just stop feeding. So, the first question we wanted to ask is, well, do we have them? Do we ha are they actually here? So, Phil went out in 2013, and he looked for them. And he did find them at most of the locations he looked at around Christchurch. Tended to be a bit higher concentrations in urban areas, or closer to urban areas, lower concentrations further away. And those concentrations, again, were comparable to what people were seeing or reporting internationally. And the majority of the particles were white or clear. Now why that's important is because white or clear plastics look to a lot of animals like food. They look like something that they should eat and they will preferentially choose to eat them. So then last year, Sam went out, it's the lady jumping out of the boat and scaring a supervisor, and we did a survey around green lip mussels. So these were taken from nine sites right around the country. We had great help from the regional councils who um, cheerfully went out and sent us back mussels. And microplastics were found at most sites. Not great concentrations, they were normally up to about two plastics per mussel, but our bottom, the smallest we could look for was, point, was 50 microns. It's likely there were smaller plastic particles, but our technique couldn't find them. Again, the majority of them were clear. And I've put this graph in here, which is all of the plastic particles found in mussels in this particular part of the survey, to show you how big they got. They got up to a millimetre. And this one here is actually a plastic fibre, which is over a millimetre long, which we would not have expected um, mussels to have taken up. We would have expected, based on how they feed, that they would have taken up much smaller particles. So this was quite a surprise for us. So then we thought, well, we have these microplastics and we know one of the concerns about them is that they are a vector for contaminants. So they might be another exposure wave, another pathway by which organisms can be exposed to contaminants. 
And many of the emerging contaminants that we're concerned about generally aren't very persistent in the environment. But because you've got a constant amount going in, we have to worry about them. And we thought, well, we wonder if some of these will stick to the plastics. And then if they stick to the plastics, they're going to hang around in the environment for longer. And now we've got an exposure pathway for organisms that hasn't really been considered. So in the second part of her project, Sam looked at whether she got more uptake of triclosan, which is an antimicrobial compound, into muscles from just dissolved in water, or if she took plastic beads and coated them with triclosan, so we now had the same concentration, it's just one was in water and one was in the water plus the beads. This picture here is um, actually just showing you, this is the, um, the gut of uh, the muscles. We use an orange marker bead, uh, an orange bead, because that was the only one we could buy. You do not want to know how much they cost for a small bottle of them. I could either buy a ton of them, which I didn't actually know where I was going to put it from a supplier, or I could pay about $500 for a small bottle. That there is just showing you how much plastic. So while we did, uh, these weren't, uh, they were sort of, weren't environmentally relevant, we just shows that if we have more plastic out in the environment, the organisms will take it up. They don't seem to be able to exclude it. If it's there, because they're filter feeders, they'll take it up. We were quite surprised that we could see it. And the answer to the question was, do, do microplastics enhance the uptake of contaminants? Well, yes, they do. The one on your left is just the triclosan in water on its own. And the one on the right is um, once the triclosan was stuck onto the plastic beads, and you can see you've got much higher concentrations. And methyl triclosan is actually a microbial breakdown product um, of triclosan, and it actually hangs around in the environment a bit longer. So that's why we looked for both of them. So now we've got this sort of enhanced um, exposure pathway as well when these contaminants come together. Now it's highly likely these contaminants are together because both of them are found in wastewater streams. And so it's likely that some of the plastics that are released from wastewater treatment plants may be coated in some contaminants as they come through. So to finish off these snapshots, yes, some of these contaminants that come from our everyday activities are present in our coastal waters and are present at the kinds of concentrations we would expect from similar countries or similar lifestyles overseas. We know our marine organisms are exposed to them and we've got some hints for some of our Tauranga species that the guidelines developed overseas may not always protect New Zealand species. And we're going to need to be very careful about looking at lifestyle and types of organism to make sure that we can um, adopt guidelines from overseas. And that microplastics are actually probably another exposure route that we're going to need to think about for different contaminants. It's just to show you that um, these are some of the recent papers that have come out to highlight the students' work. I'd like to acknowledge the Brian Mason Trust, which has been a very generous funder of most of the projects that I've shown today, uh, the University of Canterbury, regional councils, a whole range of um, collaborators and people who have worked with us uh, at a range of different universities. And I'd like to finish there. <laughs> Okay, so the floor is now open for questions from um, both our speakers. It sounds as if we're working towards going back to paper bags. Is the thing says, isn't it? Going back to paper bags. Going back to paper bags? I don't think that would be a bad thing. Um, I think our love affair with plastic is something that we are really going to have to revisit as a society. Uh, it might not just be paper bags, it might be cloth bags. It might be, does everything need to come wrapped in plastic? That is a question is we're going to have to think about. Can I ask you, Tammy, how do you get your, um, you know, the DNA from birds? I mean, mm. Can you just take a feather or do you actually need to get a blood sample? Or? Yeah, that's no, a good question. So Alison's just asked where we get the DNA from. Usually when we're using the genetic techniques, a feather will do. Um, but when we're using the genomic work, we usually get blood samples. In both cases, the other eggs babies haven't survived to reproduce, I think you said, whereas the one, the other 
one that you didn't really want had. And is that something you can see within those populations in general? Do the faculty not thrive and reproduce as effectively as the the other ones? Or? The Puaka. Well, Puaka are actually declining now as well, and so they're not doing um, fantastically well. Um, but we don't see, we, because we focus mainly on Kaki, and the, the situation for Kaki is that mortality rates are really high. So, in terms of post release, we lose a lot of birds, but there's a lot of research done around actually how those releases are done and where they're done and if we supplemental feed and if we don't and survival rates are actually getting higher and higher. So we don't think we actually have the data to, to tease those two things apart. But a lot of what we have is also just randomness, you know, in terms of who makes it and who doesn't. And in that particular scenario, no one made it from that clutch for that one bird. So the sample sizes are pretty small to be able to say. But it is, I mean, we've picked up at least two or three more this year. And so it's something we'll absolutely be keeping an eye on for sure. So you don't think the Puaka could do something when they dump their eggs? As in well, something like a dance? Well, no, 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 no. They, don't, they don't do something that then endangers the survival of the other ones. They don't, like cuckoos mm. push their eggs out. Oh, right, yeah. They don't yep. move them or do something. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's not an obligate brood parasitism like a cuckoo, which would literally kick out the eggs. It seems, if anything, you'd call it facultative brood parasitism, but we're not really sure why, why they might be doing it. And if memory serves, I think those eggs may have hatched, but the chicks just didn't survive post-release. And given the timing on those two releases, it's not that surprising because their survival rates were pretty low. But there's an intensive predator control program actually in the Tasman Valley now, and um, birds are preferentially being released to that area, and their survival rates are much higher. It's such a small population, surely you're going to end up with a very inbred uh, lot of birds, which, which would mean that the thing is robust as, as um, you know, a big population. Yep, so, so a comment around the fact that we're dealing with inbred birds, absolutely. And literally what we're trying to do is to make the best out of a bad situation by minimizing inbreeding. So because when you pair together two birds that are distantly related, you're minimizing inbreeding. And it's also why we're quite careful to say things like reduce the loss of genetic variation because we're going to lose it with such a small population size as well. Um, but we are a little bit lucky because relatively speaking, kaki are actually quite genetically diverse. And one of the things that Natalie is going to be looking at is that we think it's because when the captive breeding program was established in the early 80s, they actually sourced birds just by chance from different valleys. And we think those valleys were substructured. They were actually genetically different from one another. So we're actually doing, relatively speaking, for a for a threatened bird in New Zealand that went down to such low numbers, they're actually relatively diverse. So we're doing what we can. <laughs> uh, so have you, um, do you have any future plans to extend your contamination research into other functional groups like scrapers, like snails and uh, power? Um, to see if they are contaminated or have microplastics? Yes, so we've got a project starting next year that will probably, uh, a PhD student has put in, we're going to look at power because they scrape and because they eat turf. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also going to be having a look at wastewater treatment plants to see what comes out from them, both in their wastewater and what's in the biosolids, because the bio, a lot of the biosolids goes onto agricultural land or is used in sort of regeneration, reforestation type projects. So we want to see what's happened with those. With regards to the environmental contaminants, um, has anybody looked at how much asbestos there is kicking around since the earthquake? There, ha there has been some work, and I'm aware the Regional Council has done some monitoring around that as well. But it isn't one that I've been working on. I was just wondering, because I've worked in hospital and worked in oncology in the past, and I'm wondering if we're going to have a sudden increase in the number of people in this theory over in about 30 to 40 years. I really hope not. I think that would well, be, so that will be a, a very <laughs> unpleasant consequence. But I know some concerns were raised after the earthquakes about how much asbestos we were all exposed to. 
So I, I saw something recently about um, this idea that you know plastics break down and form microplastics, which end up in, in marine organisms, but also that uh, car, um, cotton fabric sheds fibres that and other fabric, <coughs> polyester, etc. Et everything seems to shed fibres that also end up in um, marine organisms. I should probably say that we didn't include fibres in the study simply because we didn't know how to deal with the contamination. That's something that one of my students in collaboration with ESR, and we're actually going to be working with the forensic scientists to learn how to not put fibres into it. Um, I know that I walked into the lab wearing what I didn't think was a very fluffy top and Phil, my PhD student, said, I can see you've been in the lab, look. And he had photos. So the fibres is a big problem and particularly the fibres from synthetic clothing. Cotton will eventually break down as long as it hasn't been had too much sort of treatment added to it, but our synthetics is not. But this, this was, the implication was that these things may not be any better than plastics because they end up... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And probably that's the worst, the, the saddest thing around some of the microplastics is, um, is that polar fleece was designed as a way of recycling plastic mm -hmm. and that generates a very, very large number of fibres and it probably would have been better if polar fleece had never been invented in terms of what gets shed and put out of the environment. Mm -hmm. um, with Kaki and Poaka, they can crossbreed. Would it be such a bad thing if you were to use uh, poaka and kaki just to preserve both species? Or? Mm. It's a good question. So could interbreeding be a good thing for kaki and poaka? Now, some of the work that we've done has actually shown that the reproductive success of hybrids is actually lower. So they actually are at a disadvantage. Uh, the hybrid offspring are at a disadvantage to the pure offspring. Um, but it's something that we'll actively be looking at with Natalie's work in terms of actually figuring out what in the genome might be useful, perhaps. Um, so in the short term, I would say probably not, because we know they're actually at a disadvantage, those hybrid offspring. Um, but it's, a, it's another watch this space, really, because the whole conservation conversation around hybrids is, is a is a hotbed of excitement right now. There's lots of things and lots of opinions and we're pretty excited because we're at a really cool space to actually be investigating some of those things, which with a data set, and this is one of the things about we often don't realize in New Zealand, we've got these phenomenal long-term data sets for a lot of uh, threatened species that go back 30, 40, 50 years which means we can test a lot of hypotheses as well, and that actually will future inform how we actually manage other species beyond Kaki. So it's an absolutely watch this space. I might have a question back to Sally about whether sediment size or fine sediments like still affected like contaminant pathways, like, like we talked about microplastics might affect um, the uptake of contaminants in mussels, whether like places like swimming sites in New Zealand which might have like really fine silt so might also sort of act as like carriers for certain contaminants or what that interaction might be? Yes they will in two ways. Usually the, the finer material is um, actually has more binding sites so it tends to hold on to more contaminants so we would expect that we've got a lot of sort of fine um, sediment material that we would actually have higher concentrations of contaminants and also those finer um, sort of materials are more likely to be taken up by a filter feeder as, a, as they're feeding through. Talking about Enanga and the marine environment, um, they're not in the sea for all that long. Um, the rest of the life cycle is in the rivers. Uh, have you been monitoring the different uh, toxicity or accumulation of, uh, say, diclofenac in different stages? Uh, yes, we have. So we've mainly the work we've done so has mainly been with adults, but some other work we've been doing is looking at changes in pH because that will actually change what what form the chemicals in and make it easier or more difficult to take up. And we have been looking at um, ideally we want to get into doing, and that's one of the advantages with working with Enanga is that you can work in both a fresh environment and a saline environment and see if things are different. We did try a little bit with um, bullies because they will also be tolerant. Um, they have a small problem that they eat each other, which was a bit of a challenge as a chemist because I knew about things that could die, but no one actually told me that you had experiments that could eat each other. And I initially thought everyone was pulling my leg when they said we didn't have as many fish when we started because the big ones had eaten them. But no, so we, we've got to go back and revisit that, hopefully with species that doesn't eat each other. <laughs> 
Sally, there's been uh, a lot of publicity around microcartridges. Have you noticed any change in behaviour of people who are producing uh, textiles, uh, cosmetics, and those sort of things in the awareness of that and the use of, of the microparticles? The microparticles, uh, they are being withdrawn and the New Zealand government is proposing to withdraw them but a lot of companies are voluntarily withdrawing them and they will be withdrawn from New Zealand anyway because we're a small market so things aren't, uh, aren't made for us. One thing I hadn't realised is you actually get plastic particles in some toothpastes as well, some of the whitening toothpaste, so sort of a bit of a double whammy toothpaste. Uh, but the problem that I see with withdrawing those particles, and that's great, is people then think that's a done deal, it's solved. But what we're seeing is the largest amount of the microplastics that we're finding are actually broken down fragments. So they've got rough edges and that they were bigger bits of plastic once. So we've sort of got this massive plastic soup that we're going to have to deal with. And the predictions at the moment are, depending on who does it, is somewhere between one kilo to three kilos of plastic in the ocean compared to every kilo of fish. So that I think is why there's this sort of massive push on about plastics at the moment. And fortunately that's something the community is buying into and, and people are actually saying, well hang on, we don't want to do this anymore. Okay, so I think it's time to bring this um, session to a close. So um, I'm sure you'll agree we've had some two very enjoyable and interesting talks. And it's very reassuring to know that not only uh, have we got dedicated scientists you know, tackling these important problems, but also that they are training the next generation of environmental scientists. So please join me in thanking once again both.